<coughs> Subcommittee will please come to order. This is the subcommittee's third hearing on federal policies governing private pension plans. Last week, a very positive response to the earlier hearings was included in a letter from the Department of Labor concerning proposed changes in the policing of private pension trusts and private auditors who provide material to the Department of Labor to ensure that financial and legal standards in the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, commonly known as ERISA, are met. What is at stake here is about $1.7 trillion in private pension funds. While I commend the Department on steps toward greater oversight of private pension plans, I remain very much concerned about the basic financial security of private pensions, and ultimately the financial security of retirees and current workers who expect to receive a pension after decades of hard work. Retirement benefits are earned. Pensions are not just one part of the jigsaw puzzle of corporate finances. If a piece is missing, it is important. To a retiree, it may mean the difference between paying the heating bill or living in a cold room. <clears throat> this morning, we will look at a number of facets of federal pension policy and examine how policies can be improved for the benefit of the worker who has earned benefits and who has every right to expect that he or she will receive them upon retirement. When we look at pension law and federal practice, I think it is necessary to assure working Americans that most plans are healthy and safe. <clears throat> I think this is an important item which needs underscoring. Most private pension plans are safe and they are healthy. But it is equally necessary to search for problem areas so that we can make this assurance to all working Americans. Recent reports on Eastern Airlines, First Executive Corporation, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation raise <coughs> concerns in a number of areas. First, is the law too lenient with companies who have underfunded pension plans? Does the IRS allow too many waivers of corporate contributions to pension funds? Can a company dump pension liabilities on the government and come out the other side of Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceedings with an operational company and an operational pension plan, but with the federal government bankrolling pensions due. Where does the federal government stand when creditors line up before a company in bankruptcy court? When a healthy pension is terminated, what is the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation's obligation to see that adequate and secure annuities are purchased for those in its pension system? Most importantly, how financially sound is the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation in our rapidly changing economic climate? These are not theoretical questions. For example, in bankruptcy court, creditors line up this way. Someone with a frequent flyer airline ticket stands in front of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation and the thousands of retirees for whom they may ultimately be responsible. Another example. A troubled pension fund may win waivers from the IRS and not contribute to an already underfunded pension plan. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation has no special legal authority 
to participate in the waiver process. Yet, it is the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation that may have to pay the price of an, of an IRS decision. Instead of stopping an accident from happening, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation is like the State Farm Insurance Agent, who is there to write a check after a disaster happens. The PBGC, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, itself needs to work within a steady economy, receive a consistent income from insured pension plans, and have no new, large, underfunded pension trusts going under. Yet the economy is unpredictable. Plans terminated ultra new plans at a rate of four to one. And the PBGC itself has a watch list of some 25 companies whose pension plans are weak and troubled, in addition to a list of 50 large underfunded plans. The Kentucky Derby, it seems to me, is much more predictable than all of the assumptions PBGC has to make to balance its books. The system for most pension trusts works well. But the small push it would take the rock, to rock the PBGC's boat could have retirees as well as the ultimate guarantor, the American taxpayer, bailing out a punctured rowboat named the RISA for decades to come. We all want to avoid this scenario. This morning, I would like to hear how we can do it. The subject is complex, but the issues are very simple. Are the hundreds of thousands of American working men and women who confidently expect that their pensions will be there when they retire be disappointed? be left out in the cold. That is the subject matter of our hearing. I'd now like to ter uh, turn to the ranking Republican on the subcommittee, Congressman <coughs> Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When a company with an underfunded pension plan has filed for bankruptcy under Chapter 11, everyone has an interest to ensure that the underfunded plan is not terminated. The Pension Barant uh, Benefit Guarantee Corporation, PBGC, the employer, the employees all stand to lose. Losses to PBGC, a possible end to reorganization which would have allowed the employer to continue to operate, and a possible loss of both jobs and pension benefits to employees may well occur. The overall magnitude of government obligation, obligation is really staggering. More than $6 trillion at least exist in contingent liabilities and other risks, according to the Heritage Foundation in December of 89. There's also concern over this PGBC which ensures the private pension plans of 66 million Americans and is currently anywhere from 1.1 billion to 1.5 billion in the red. The Labor Department's acting inspector general last month warned Congress that federal government supervision and law enforcement has created a window of opportunity for those who would embezzle and steal. But policing pensions is virtually impossible because the Labor Department only has 300 inspectors for over 900,000 plans. There are now 17 bills before Congress that demand that some or all of the trust funds be kept off budget to keep wicked people's hands off them, supposedly the United States Congress. I would like to think not. In fact, trust fund spending is like any other government spending. It has to be paid for by taxes or borrowing, which some people don't understand, because all fund balances are held in government paper. The trust of our country and the trust of every individual ever held a retirement pension van is in our hands. It's as if an indebted person had put aside a little nest egg of savings consisting entirely of I IOUs signed by himself. The funds do worse than confuse federal bookkeeping, and which one of the aspects I'd like to address, Mr. Chairman, is how many accounting systems do we have? The last time I heard from testimony before this Government Operations Full Committee was there are over 240 different accounting systems in the United States government. This is a travesty. It's an insult. They confuse real policy choices, and that's basically the problem. PB PBGC's single employer insurance fund currently has $1.1 billion, according to government estimates, and they said it goes as high as $1.5 to outstanding outside uh, estimates. 
We want to examine the role and operation of PBGC, the IRS, and the Department of Labor's Pension and Welfare Benefits Administration to ensure that they or we do not needlessly add to the loss of this fund. I look forward to joining in this hearing. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Before we call our first witness, I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Lisa Phillips uh, of our staff who did most of the work preparing for this hearing. She did an outstanding job. I would first like to ask uh, Mr. William Sherry, Airline Coordinator for the International Association of Machinists, to come to the witness table. Uh, I understand you'll be accompanied by Mr. Randy Barber, David Freeman, and John Edmund. Will you please all stand? Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you are about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I can't hear you. Yes. Very good. Please be seated. There wasn't any doubt the answer, was there, Mr. Chairman? None. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Sherry, you uh, have a prepared statement uh, which will be entered in the record in its entirety. Uh, you may proceed any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning uh, to you and members of your committee. I want to thank you for accepting our long statement into the record. My name is William L. Sherry. I'm the airline coordinator for the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, better known as the IAM. The IAM represents 80,000 employees in a variety of industries throughout the nation. We are the largest union in the air transport industry representing more than 90,000 employees in a wide range of craft or classes, including 8,900 striking Eastern Airline employees. Prior to Texas Air acquisition of Eastern in 1986, there were 13,500 IM members employed by the airline. With me today, on my far left, is John Edmond, our attorney from the law firm of Greery, Edmond and James. To my immediate left is Randy Barber, who has uh, been a pension advisor to the Eastern Airline Pension Plan and also a trustee for the IAM Pension Plan. And to my right is Brian Freeman, who has been with the Treasury Department from the year of 1976-81 as a financial consultant and further worked for the DOL as a financial consultant from the year of 1984-86. I'm here today to provide the IAM's analysts of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation's role in the Eastern Airlines bankruptcy. I will also discuss the actions, or rather lack of action, of the PBGC, the IRS, and the Department of Labor over the two and a half years preceding this bankruptcy, during which Texas Air systematically looted Eastern. I will show how these government agencies sat idly by in spite of the fact that the IAM repeatedly provided them with all of the information they needed to justify a forcible intervention to protect the Eastern pension plans and participants. In reviewing all the incredible financial manipulations that Frank Lorenzo and his Texas Air Empire successfully pulled off, a single question repeatedly came to mind. Where was the government while Eastern was being looted and its pension funds were being used as a bank for Texas Air? When hundreds of millions of dollars of assets were stripped from Eastern, undermining both Eastern's viability and the resources directly available to meet its huge $1.1 billion unfunded pension obligations. Where was the PBGC? When Texas Air tapped Eastern's pension funds for more than $200 million in loans for purposes that only benefited Texas Air via three separate funding waivers. Where was the IRS? When Texas Air caused Eastern to divert required pension contributions to further Texas Air corporate agenda in violation of multiple provisions of ERISA. Where was the Department of Labor? Were these agencies simply inept or were they somehow powerless to act, outmaneuvered by a known manipulator of legal technicalities and political influence? 
Although the Eastern situation contains many specific and outrageous elements, I believe that there are broad lessons to be learned which apply to any control group where one or more affiliates has significant unfunded pension obligations. And there are important lessons to be learned about the lack of backbone which infects the PBGC, the IRS, and the Department of Labor where politically powerful employers are concerned. Texas Air acquisition of Eastern provides that most disturbing example of a classic leverage buyout forcing the target company to use its own assets and to finance more than 50% of the total purchase price. To Frank Lorenzo, Eastern's pension plans were just too tempting a piggy bank to ignore, so he rated them at every chance he got. Eastern Airlines pension funds have been at the center of Texas Air's and Frank Lorenzo's manipulation of Eastern from the beginning. Even before the acquisition was approved, Texas Air was already exploiting Eastern's pension assets. In the fall of 1986, faced with increasing need to raise more money, Texas Air forced Eastern to seek a funding waiver for $60 million in pension contributions. The acquisition agreement required Eastern to pay out $108 million of its own money to Eastern shareholders. In addition, $230 million in new Eastern preferred stock. Further, as was confirmed by the bankruptcy court appointed examiner David Shapiro, Eastern was also required to pay out on another $90 million in preferred dividend arrearages and acquisition-related expenses that were triggered solely by the Texas Air takeover itself. Thus, Eastern, which had only months before threatened bankruptcy, was faced with the prospect of shelling out about $200 million in cash to help finance its own acquisition. Since the IM had previously negotiated for a modified form of joint pension trustee and had the right to designate two of five trustees on the Eastern IM pension plan, we were in an excellent position to understand what was really going on behind the scenes. It was clear to the IM that the decision not to pay the $60 million dollars in pension contributions was not made in the interest of the participants and the beneficiaries, nor even of Eastern, which was being forced to incur huge amounts of new debt even while it was being downsized in favor of Texas Air, Continental, and People's Express, which were subsidiaries of Texas Air Corporation. The IEM and the IEM trustees vigorously protested Eastern's proposed funding waiver. We went to the Department of Labor we went to the Internal Revenue Service, and we went to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. We provided them with documentation, and we asked them to investigate. We pointed out to DOL that Texas Air was using its control of Eastern to cause it to divert monies which should have been used to fund pension obligations and instead were used for the improper purpose of funding a leveraged buyout. We received a polite hearing, but the DOL took no action. We corresponded with and repeatedly attempted to make other contacts with the IRS. Our request was simple. We asked that the IRS require Eastern to, buy, to provide us with a copy of the full waiver application it had submitted to the service. Eastern had refused to provide us with the data they presented to the IRS in support, in support of the waiver application. However, we're confident that if we were given access to this data, we could convincingly rebut Eastern's claims that the waiver was in the best interest of Eastern's pension plans and participants. We asked the IRS to provide us with reasonable time to comment once we had been provided a copy of the application. Incredibly, not only did the IRS refuse to provide us with a basis for responding to Eastern's assertions, the IRS actually refused to acknowledge that Eastern had even submitted a waiver application despite the fact that the IAM had been notified by Eastern of this action pursuant to requirements of law. After the IRS granted Eastern a conditional funding waiver, we filed suit against both the IRS and PBGC seeking to enjoin them from finalizing the waiver or any collateral agreement until we had an opportunity to make meaningful comments on Eastern's funding waiver application. The courts, although sympathetic, ruled that Congress had not intended to require that unions and participants be given an opportunity to make such comments. While this litigation was proceeding, we contacted the PBGC 
in an effort to help it secure the best possible collateral, assuming the funding waiver would be finalized. In our meeting with the PBGC, we were able to show that Eastern had not even provided the agency with information about its largest single uncollateralized asset, its computer reservation and automation subsidiaries known as System One Direct Assets and Eastern Automation Systems, Inc. We furnished the PBGC with a detailed analyst of the actual value of these subsidiaries including estimates from a number of different sources val valuing SODA and ESI at $250 to $500 million. It is worthwhile to note that examiner David Shapiro recently concluded that the true worth of SODA and e EASI was in the range of $250 to $350 million. Yet, as the PBGC pondered the collateral it would require Easton to post, the company sold these valuable assets to Texas Air for a 25-year, 6%, $100 million note. We urge the PBGC to require that these assets be posted as collateral and to take action to prevent Texas Air from stripping them from Eastern. Our urgings were all to no avail. The PBGC was so compliant to Texas Air's wishes that it soon agreed to modify its already inept collateral agreement with Eastern. In late 1987, as Eastern was maneuvering to sell the shuttle operation, the Texas Air Controlled Partnership, the PBGC, voluntarily agreed to amend the collateral agreement in ways that significantly weakened the PBGC's voice in the dis disposition of collateral assets. Incredibly, this initial shuttle transaction was itself designed to avoid PBGC control group liability by leaving Texas Air with only a 79% ownership stake. This, in the words of a senior Texas Air official, would keep it outside of any pension-related liability loop. In September 1988, Easton applied for yet another funding waiver, this time for over $100 million, even though Eastern had almost $400 million in cash. Although the IRS granted Eastern only a limited funding waiver, it was still willing, in effect, provide Eastern with over $100 million in short-term financing even after Texas Air extensive manipulation of Eastern assets were exposed. Since Eastern filed for Chapter 11 protection in March 1989, the PBGC and other government agencies have engaged in a lot of hand-wringing and have expressed deep concern about the deteriorating situation in Eastern. Tragically, they haven't done anything to protect either the PBGCs PBGC, the plans, or the participants' interests during the course of the bankruptcy. When the Uberog Group proposed to purchase Eastern, all the PBGC could say is that they didn't believe that Eastern was viable without the shuttle, and that it was very worried about this proposed sale since it would take Eastern out from under Texas Air Control Group liability. When the shuttle was finally sold to Donald Trump in June 1989... Let me, let me stop you for a second yes. because I want to be sure everybody understands the concept of control group liability. Could you define that for us clearly? I'll, Randy Barber, sure. please. It's my, our understanding that control group liability basically um, is a test where members, uh, affiliates of a corporation are only subject to the ability... are only subject to the ability of the PBGC to go after their assets if they are owned 80% or more by the parent. And if it's below 80%, then the PBGC does not have a recourse against the assets of that affiliate. That's correct. So your point is that if the control group can reduce its ownership to under 80%, then it's free of any obligation. That's our understanding, Mr. Chairman. And uh, clearly a, a control group which wants to rid itself of any obligation uh, would like to see its percentage of ownership drop below 80 percent. That's correct from our viewpoint. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, since we're on that, could you just explain, though, how unloading Eastern Shuttle gets them below that 80 percent? Well, first of all, on the shuttle, as everybody knows, I hope on this committee, that that was the crown jewel of Eastern Airlines. That produced uh, something like... We understand that. Okay. Yeah, but, but I don't understand. I'm missing some basic fact that I probably shouldn't even be willing to admit. Um, I don't understand how selling a part of Eastern 
means that um, Continental still doesn't own more than 80% of Eastern. So where am I, what am I missing here? I'm the, the point, go ahead. If I could, the, the point is the, PBG, uh, the PBGC had indicated, first of all, that it did not believe Eastern was viable without um, the air shuttle, just in their economic analysis. And secondly, the sale of that operating asset took a major operating portion out from under Eastern Airlines, yeah. which meant that that was, it was turned into cash, but it was no longer available as an operating asset either of Eastern or for the PBGC to look to, to a viable company. Okay. Uh, uh, my problem, though, is understanding if you have Eastern this size and you sell a part of it and Eastern is this size, Continental still owns the same percentage of what's left. Yeah, the, the, the issue that was just made wasn't the 80 percent issue. Uh, the sale of the shuttle was is separate from the... Okay. the because the viability... That's right. And there were two proposed transactions. The first one was designed to, in, in, in uh, Robert Snedeker's own words, who's executive vice president of, of Texas Air, so, so to bring it below 80%, 80%. If I might, uh, my colleague, will you a moment? Sure. I think it might help if you'd explain how they did go below the 80% uh, ownership margin. The first proposed shuttle transaction, which did not consummate because we were able to successfully challenge it in court, proposed that Eastern would sell the shuttle to a Texas Air subsidiary, which would in turn sell it to a limited partnership. The limited partnership would be owned 79% by Texas Air, 20% by outside investors, and 1% by a company called Jet Capital, which is basically the uh, holding company that controls Texas Air, but it, you know, it is not considered part of the control group. Okay, let me, uh, I, I won't keep stretching this out, but let me just be clear on this. I understand how you're saying, in essence, Texas uh, Air still owns part of the shuttle, but less than, but less than 80%, correct? That was the proposed okay. first shuttle transaction. But what remained of, of Eastern would still have been owned, what, by 100 percent by, by, uh, uh, That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, in fact, okay. We'll, we'll take it later. I, I understand that. I just, I'm, I just, I found that the, the, your statement a little misleading to me then. The, the, the issue, though, of selling the shuttle has nothing to do with the remainder of, of the Eastern assets. It's still owned by Continental. Eastern Airlines is owned by Texas Air Corporation. Texas Air, yeah. Continental is yeah. subsidiary Texas of TAC, Air. and it Eastern is, still, is it also. Is, it is still owned by, by Texas Air. That's correct. Right. So the 80% has no impact uh, on the sale of the shuttle. It just means that uh, they, that first arrangement with, Tex, with, with selling the shuttle, they would still own 79% of the shuttle, uh, and that part would not come under their jurisdiction. Except they did all this in lieu of PBGC's rule to bring it under the 80 percent mark, in my opinion, to get around their pension liabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Please go ahead. Unbelievably, the IRS granted Eastern yet another funding waiver. It's third in four years for $26 million in September 1989. When Eastern's unsecured creditors very recently negotiated an agreement that would strip $300 million in cash from the estate, none of which would go to PBGC or to pension plans. The PBGC was characteristically silent. Even though the unsecured creditors are turning themselves into secured creditors ahead of any future PBGC claims by obtaining Eastern's Atlanta Hub facilities as collateral for $190 million in New Eastern and Continental Notes. Also very recently, Texas Air entered into an agreement with Electronic Data Systems to sell 50% of Eastern's former System 1 computer reservation systems for $250 million. Where is the PBGC? Don't they realize that this agreement will take a half a billion dollar asset out from under Texas Air control group liability? Why hasn't the PBGC moved to protect its claims? And where will the PBGC be when the viability of Eastern's plan of reorganization is tried before the bankruptcy court? We know that PBGC officials don't believe that Eastern is viable, but we don't know why they are so deafeningly silent. Over the course of the past three and one half years, the PBGC has sat idly by while assets after assets was transferred 
from Eastern to Texas Air or its other affiliates, gates, aircraft, routes, slots, computer systems, the reservation system, cash parts, and other equipment, thus significantly reducing the direct asset pool available to the PBGC as a major potential creditor. If the P PBGC doesn't finally begin to protect the interest of the Eastern plans and participants, not to mention PBGC's own enormous potential exposure, exposure, it will in effect continue to be Frank Lorenzo's largest and friendliest banker. Whether or not they consciously have intended to do so, the IRS, PBGC, and DOL have effectively been co-conspirators with Frank Lorenzo, helping him perpetuate a fraud not only on Eastern employees and the traveling public, but on every pension plan and participant in the country which will eventually be required to fund the Eastern pension plan liabilities. Unfortunately, it's clear that the government blew it. All the information they needed to take action was handed to them several different times on a silver platter, but they refused to act and only acquiesced to Texas Air's plans. These agencies acted like the monkeys on many a dashboard. The IRS wants to hear no evil, the DOL wants to speak no evil, and the PBGC wants to see no evil. So where does this leave us? What are the PBGC's options? While it is very, it is very, very late in the game, there are still some actions the PBGC can take to minimize the damage. In our judgment, under Easton's latest plan of reorganization, Easton will run out of cash by 1993 at the latest even assuming that it will remain marginally viable until then. At that point, Eastern will almost certainly be forced to close down and liquidate. It is highly unlikely that there will be a sufficient assets in the rest of Texas Air Empire to fund the Eastern pension liability. What should PBGC do? It should move as forcefully as necessary to secure its interest now at all levels of Texas Air and obtain sufficient and enforceable collateral and confidence for the $1.1 billion in unfunded pension obligations the B PBGC is exposed to. In short, the PBGC should do whatever it needs to in order to ensure that no more Eastern assets are stripped right out from under its nose. From our unfortunate experience with Texas Air and Eastern, the IM has developed four basic recommendations which are broadly applicable to the B PBGC's mandate to protect the pension benefits of all workers. One, whenever one or more affiliates of a holding company or other form of control group have significant unfunded pension liabilities, the PBGC must, must be much more diligent in analyzing the impact of asset transfers and other upstreaming of corporate resources. The PBGC should be empowered and required to ensure that any upstreaming of assets be accompanied with a comparable upstreaming of liabilities. Two, the threshold for control group liability should be lowered from the current 80% to no more than 50%, and the PBGC should be able to apply an alternative actual control test for affiliates which are less than 50% owned. In addition, the PBGC should have a five-year look back to former control group affiliates. Finally, the current 30% net worth cap on the liens the PBGC can impose should be increased to 100%. Three, the PBGC should be able to secure unfunded pension obligations among all control group affiliates when there is a major reorganization or restructuring of a significant affiliate without resorting to the drastic step of forcing an involuntary pension plan termination. This should be available to the PBGC whenever there is a major reshuffling of corporate assets and liabilities, whether or not one or more affiliates of a control group are in bankruptcy. The PBGC must be able to protect its interests and those of pension participants by perfecting liens and imposing appropriate confidence, just like any other creditor would do in such a situation. Four, as suggested by the D.C. Circuit, the IRS and the PBGC should be required to involve participants and their representatives in a meaningful way during their consideration of funding waiver requests and in any consideration of appropriate collateral to be posted for any waive contributions. Often, 
participants and their representatives will have insights into an employer's representations, motivations, and strategies which are not readily apparent to these government agencies. Certainly, we believe that we could have significantly enlightened both the PBGC and the IRS in connection with the three Eastern funding waivers. And we might even have been able to help them avert the pension disaster that we mu now must all confront. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we're here to address any questions that the committee may have of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a number of questions, and uh, I'm sure so will my colleagues. And uh, I suspect um, Eastern and PBGC will want to react to many of the, many of the statements uh, you made, sir. Um, let me direct you to page 8 in your testimony, the bottom paragraph. Whether or not they consciously have intended to do so, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, PBGC, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and the Department of Labor have effectively been co-conspirators with Frank Lorenzo, helping him perpetrate a fraud not only on Eastern employees and the traveling public, but on every pension plan and participant in the country, which will eventually be required to fund the Eastern pension plan liabilities. Would one of you gentlemen expand on this and explain this statement. Go ahead. That's how we feel as an organization, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the simple fact is our records show that he went in for three waivers and he did, he was granted these three waivers to, uh, I guess, a tune of $191,400,000. Well, in co-conspirator co is a strong phrase. Uh, are you suggesting that the Department of Labor, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and the Internal Revenue Service, in fact, conspired with uh, um, Texas Air to bring about uh, this uh, underfunding, uh, which eventually, as you say, will be uh, forcing the traveling public uh, to the taxpayers to to cough up the necessary funds to, to pay the pensions that were promised? Is that your testimony? Well, I don't believe the three agencies brought about the situation. The situation was brought about Eastern, by Eastern Airlines. And in my opinion, they found a source, which is DOL, IRS, and PBGC, where they could get waivers. And they did receive them, as you well know, to the tune of $191,400,000 when, in 1987 example, they had $400,000 in cash. And Mr. Phil Bakes... At you that mean $400 million. I'm sorry, $400 million, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Phil Bakes, president of Eastern Airlines at that time, he felt, and there is quotes out in the street, that it was easier to borrow this money from the federal government than from private sources. So it leaves us, as an organization, that we feel that, uh, yes, there has been uh, some government officials, excuse my language, in bed with Frank Lorenzo. And it's a well-known factor that he has 17 former government officials on his payroll right now working for Texas Air Corporation. And in our opinion, they know how to get around red tape with the United States government. If I could just briefly explain. Please. I was personally involved in, in several meetings with a number of the government agencies. And <clears throat> the statement says that whether or not they were intending to be so they were in effect co-conspirators and at least was our impression that we would continue to uh, bring them information, meet with them um, and at least with a couple of the agencies we got a very polite, friendly reception but there was never any action. It seemed to us that now one way or another... explain to me, yes. since you were personally involved, sir, mm -hmm. what is your judgment as to the alleged failure of the appropriate government agencies to understand your presentations and to act on those? My personal judgment is that we were dealing with non-political appointees who we believed actually understood the situation and for one reason or another, whether it was because of limited enforcement resources or whether or not it because it was a political hot potato, um, these individuals felt that there was no way to pursue the issues that we were raising with them. Why? I would have to be able to read their minds. I, I, I felt that the, at least the individuals we dealt with were of good faith, 
but I was not involved in meetings with their superiors, and it clearly went no farther than that. I would be jumping to a conclusion if I were to tell you why exactly. Any other comments on this issue from any of you gentlemen? Are you accusing the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation of uh, non-feasance? You say, for instance, we know that PBGC officials don't believe that Eastern is viable, but we don't know why they are so deafeningly silent. They are remaining silent. They're taking none of the actions which, in your view, would have been necessary to prevent what you view as a major crisis from developing. Now, is, in, in, in your judgment, did this come about through incompetence, uh, through, uh, as you were suggesting, uh, uh, willingness to cooperate in the stripping of assets from Eastern? And if so, what motivated that willingness? Mr. Chairman, first of all, as our statement points out, we think that they have sat by idly. Uh, not only as facts were presented by our organization, but other organizations such as the Airline Pilots Association and the Transport Workers Union also. And further, they're sitting by idly before the bankruptcy court at this point. And as you well know, there's been billions of dollars of assets spun off from Eastern Airlines, either upstreamed into Continental or Texas Air Corporation, or sold outright, such as the shuttle to Don Trump, and what we have before the DOT right now is the Latin American routes being sold to uh, um, uh, American Airlines. And we see that the PBGC, with the rules that they have before them, should have been moving in months ago to try to get some collateral uh, for the employees that are participants in this pension plan. And they haven't done it. And they're still sitting by idly. So I can only draw one conclusion, that they favor all this stuff that Mr. Lorenzo is doing. And I don't understand it because I've seen other cases within the air transport industry where PBGC has moved in and obtained collateral. But in this case here, for some reason, they're reluctant. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me add to that. Please. Um, I'm not sure that I would uh, uh, accuse uh, PBGC of uh, malfeasance or misfeasance. Uh, uh, part of the issue, I think, is uh, an absence of uh, the right tools uh, to problem solve and the absence of a, uh, a congressional mandate uh, that instructs PBGC to do they certain are willing, things. willing but unable. That's uh, your testimony. Or, or uh, unclear with respect to uh, what that mandate uh, is uh, from the Congress. Uh, often what happens in these situations is that uh, Congress enacts rules, uh, uh, permits something like a termination, which is the, uh, uh, the atom bomb, uh, and doesn't uh, instruct uh, an agency uh, with respect to when to use it uh, and when to pursue other tools that might otherwise be available to the agency. Uh, an agency where it doesn't have a specific uh, detailed mandate and very limited tools uh, is generally uh, a creature of the uh, whoever is leading the agency or whoever in, in uh, the Congress or within a committee uh, is sitting on that agency. Uh, and uh, particularly in the cases of the Department of Labor and PBGC, uh, things aren't clear and their mandate over the years has developed in, in uh, a different policy way, uh, focusing on certain policy issues. These are financial issues and, and uh, they are uh, unfocused, uh, don't have the, the, uh, the right tools, the right uh, type staff, the right resources available. Uh, and I think part of the, the, uh, the problem is a, a congressional mandate uh, issue. Well, um, the IRS is not a new agency. It seems to be quite clear of uh, what its uh, sphere of authority is. Yet you are testifying, page 7, unbelievably the IRS granted Eastern yet another funding waiver. Well, how do you explain the series of what you call unbelievable actions, uh, uh, Ms. Sherry, with respect to the IRS? The IRS knows what it can and cannot do. Yeah, I believe that statement uh, 
It was made in conjunction what we were going through at the time, Mr. Chairman. Our organization was trying to reach a fair and equitable agreement with Eastern Airlines, and they were crying poverty all over the place, not just with our union. And yet uh, they went out and once again obtained a waiver, as I understand it, uh, I think it was for $26 million, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, meantime, across the table, what they were doing with our pension plan and requesting from this union, and we couldn't agree, which led ultimately to a strike, is that they didn't want to provide any increases in pension benefits across the table, and they basically froze the plan. They implemented these new conditions on March 4th, 1989. And uh, where the rest of the industry, Eastern is by no means a leader when it comes to pensions. Uh, most of our major carriers are sitting at anywhere between $40 to $42 per month per year of service. They froze the Eastern plan at $35 per month per year of service. And it just wasn't registering. We were checking all our finances at the time, and once again they wanted the employees to pay in them negotiations, our organization, anyways, to the tune of $150 million in concessions over a three-year period, per year, I should say. And uh, we're just amazed how the government can go out and basically it's a form of a loan for $26 million during that period of time. Yes, I'm, I'm not an attorney, and I've been in the position Stop of bragging asking. before the I, 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 I thought I'd establish my bona fides first. Um, I've, I've asked any number of attorneys at different occasions what the PBGC's actual authority is, and it does seem to me there's some, some confusion there. And what we're truly mystified about and, and we're trying to understand is it would appear to us that if the PBGC believes that Eastern is not viable, um, that it would be using whatever leverage it could, among other things, to keep as much assets in the estate as possible. And for instance, helping perfect um, a $26 million um, uh, waiver while Eastern was in bankruptcy certainly bothers us. But at least from my perspective, it seems to me that one of the problems that PBGC has is that it can threaten the financial equivalent or the pension equivalent of, of nuclear war. They can do a, 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 um, an involuntary forced termination. We know the PBGC is doing everything it can to keep from terminating any more plans, including the involuntaries. Now, when you're playing a game of chicken with someone like Frank Lorenzo, and uh, at least it's my belief that he probably doesn't believe they would ever actually do an involuntary termination, the question is what kind of leverage does PBGC have left in order to protect its position? It appears to us, at least from the position we're sitting in, that they, uh, they apparently don't have much leverage at all, whether or not they want to use it. We have two other problems that are part of this to follow up on uh, the issue that you asked before. Could you talk in the mic, I'm please? sorry. Two other um, uh, problems. That has no mic, so that's, that's, that's an illusion that you're talking <laughs> okay. into. So Many things in Washington are yeah. illusory. Um, okay. And you hit it, her ears went like this. <laughs> uh, two other elements that are characteristics <laughs> or attributes of uh, the problem. Uh, one is uh, government agencies um, generally like to delay stepping up and, and uh, problem solving uh, or taking responsibility to, uh, that produces problems, uh, short-term problems. Uh, and I think probably in this case uh, uh, certain people within PBGC uh, convince themselves that uh, the problem uh, would go away or might not uh, materialize on their watch. Uh, without focusing on, on the, uh, uh, the, the realities of the, the situation uh, before them. The other element was during, during part of this uh, time frame, uh, there was a changing of the guard uh, at PBGC uh, and a lack of continuity, at least at the senior level. So that was another element of this. Uh, you asked about the Internal Revenue Service, uh, and uh, I find that, uh, to be quite candid with you, incomprehensible. Uh, how the uh, Internal Revenue Service, which doesn't have the same ongoing changing of the guard and does have the depth of resources uh, and the uh, and experience uh, uh, that PBGC doesn't uh, and the Department of Labor doesn't, uh, incomprehensible that it didn't address the situation. And I think uh, one could draw their, their own conclusions on that, either uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, the IRS uh, was wishfully thinking the problem would go away, uh, erroneously analyzed information. Uh, was influenced uh, by uh, other uh, uh, people in the, in the administration. Uh, the IRS has been known to be influenced. Um, uh, or um, just basically screwed up. And it's, that is, in fact, incomprehensible. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think with all the revelation and the uh, 
uh, near accusations here. I'm not yet prepared to handle this, but I'll do the best I can. I would like to clarify a couple of things. I think uh, the gentleman, uh, your name again, sir? Freeman. Mr. Right. Freeman made a statement that uh, uh, that you would not agree with the malfeasance and misfeasance uh, No, I, I didn't say that. I'm not, I said I wasn't sure whether that was the issue. It isn't necessarily well, are you the an case. Attorney, may... sir? Are you an attorney? Uh, I have a, a couple law degrees, All but right. I, uh, I, I I'm not avoid practicing law. I'm not in anybody's camp. I've been studying this for over two weeks now, intensely trying to catch up with what has occurred. But I want to be equally fair with both sides. Are you charging fraud? I, I'm not charging anything personally. I'm uh, and are you to, charging to malfeasance? You're asking me personally. Yes, well, as as a member of this group, did you have any any hand in writing this statement? Uh, I reviewed uh, drafts of it along the way. Well, the term fraud is used, and that's a very, very, uh, very, very serious charge. I just want to know if you associate yourself with that. With the use of that word? Yes. No. Do you associate yourself with the word mis misfeasance? I think uh, there is either misfeasance or nonfeasance here. All right. Would you explain to me as a layman, then, um, I have not yet had completely conveyed to me the legal violation that took place. Could you explain to me the misfeasance that has taken place? The, the, the question you're asking... If there were asking, misfeasance, what would it consist of at this stage? I, I'm confused as what they did extra-legally or perhaps thoughtlessly or carelessly I, or I, callously. Okay. I'm trying to make that distinction. All right. the, the, uh, I don't know because I haven't gone back through uh, and addressed the issue of whether there were clear vi violations of the law and responsibilities. But the point I think that is being made is that throughout this period of time, the, uh, the PBGC, DOL, and the IRS did not uh, r uh, aggressively uh, protect the government's interest in this proceeding uh, with respect and with respect to the, to the waivers. And as a result of their failure uh, to uh, uh, act in a way to protect the federal fisc, given the risk's presence, uh, have uh, exposed uh, the government uh, to significant potential uh, costs. Right. Beyond that, which it would have otherwise been exposed to. If I may summarize, it seems to me that you're, you're claiming more callousness and indifference to the well-being of the individuals supposedly guaranteed by the pension plan than anything else. I mean, it just, it, that's the frame that takes place in my mind. No, I, th I think they're focusing, we're focusing on two it's stronger issues. stronger than that. No, two issues. Not merely the individual participants, but also uh, the government and the government's exposure. And, and one is looking at the situation and saying there's something wrong here. Right. What should issue. you are, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. You claim that there is no policy or not a clear-cut policy. What do you think the policy should be? Um, I think uh, the, the last two pages of the testimony clearly focus that. The four uh, recommendations. Four specific recommendations. I think that uh, the issue that Congress has to, uh, has to ultimately address uh, and its failure to act uh, or failure to address it effectively is in addressing it, uh, is uh, what uh, responsibilities uh, it is imposing uh, on, uh, um, on plan sponsors, uh, what uh, actions plan sponsors may take uh, with respect to uh, pension plan assets and with respect to their obligations to fund those plans, uh, and um, uh, probably uh, as, as uh, importantly, if not more importantly, uh, what uh, uh, responsibilities the uh, PBGC, i.e. the government, and what uh, rights the government has uh, to enforce those uh, responsibilities. Uh, I think one of the problems that one has, uh, which uh, uh, at least occurred uh, with, the, with the inception of ERISA, is that uh, Congress thinks or thought that it had, uh, by enacting ERISA in the form that it did uh, enact it, um, uh, protected adequately protected uh, pension plan participants against uh, abuses that had uh, uh, been experienced uh, at least through the, uh, through the late 70s. Uh, and I think uh, that what is clear is that uh, uh, that uh, has not occurred uh, and that one must review the situation to see what other abuses uh, must, uh, should be addressed. Uh, I think the existence of ERISA in its current form uh, misleads uh, people into thinking that uh, there is adequate protection there. If I might pursue that for a moment, does ERISA serve a purpose? Clearly does. Limited. It clearly does not. No, it clearly does serve a purpose what and purpose a useful does it purpose. Serve? 
uh, at this point in time. Uh, it uh, limits, uh, pr imposes statutorily certain rules uh, on uh, uh, plan uh, sponsors and plan trustees uh, uh, with respect to certain transactions with respect to the plan. And uh, in the establishment of uh, uh, PBGC, uh, has guaranteed a, a certain benefit level and provided some uh, uh, ability to redress uh, abuses. If I could address the question you asked previously about our statement, which is that, uh, that Frank Lorenzo has perpetuated a fraud not only on Eastern employees, but the traveling public and other pension, and the pension, plan, and the pension plans tonight. as well. Um, I can sympathize with your problem in terms of getting up to speed, because what's going on at Eastern has, has not only gone on for a number of years, mm -hmm. but it has been extraordinarily complex. But to put that into a context, I would first recommend to you the report of the court-appointed examiner, David Shapiro, who concluded that Eastern had been stripped of somewhere between 283 and 403 million dollars in assets. That is something we have been charging for a very long time. If I might interrupt, did yes. he conclude that they were illegally stripped? He concluded that there was sufficient cause of action that had he not entered into an agreement with Texas Air Corporation in his settlement, he would have recommended that the assets of the estate be used to assert the claim. Was that one of the was that not one of the tools he was supposed to have in order to force a settlement? Well, I'm trying to get a handle on what's unethical and what's illegal. I believe and his conclusion was that it was not legal, that, it was in, that, that there wasn't a claim that the estate had because it was not a legal uh, transfer of assets, that it had been underpaid by that range of amounts. I'm further confused by the fact I see several lawyers both adding, uh, nodding yes and some nodding no. So I guess that uh, that is a question okay, you have to that, be that was really just However, I'm not disputing. I'm just that, trying to say was, there is confusion right. on this point. And That's that was, my, okay, that is and, my and, point. And th that was simply a preface to say that our belief, as we've looked at this, and we've, we're deeply involved in this, but we really did try to take a step back and clearly what this is, is this is a holding company with a number of different affiliates that has moved assets around among the affiliates. One of those affiliates had a significant unfunded pension obligation. In the context of our view that Eastern was looted of at least a quarter of a billion dollars, if not a half a billion dollars, to the extent that the pension plans were claimants to Eastern, and the holding company caused those assets to be moved elsewhere, that at least in the non strictly legal sense, as a non-attorney here, I would say that is a perpetuating a fraud on the employees, the public, and anyone else who is ultimately going to have to pay for those unfunded pension obligations. And that is the context of that statement. Well, let me, um, if you're le seeking a legal rubric, um, there is uh, something both in common law but also under the bankruptcy law and uh, Please state. speak into the I'm mic. I apologize. Uh, if you're seeking a legal rubric, uh, and uh, the, the issue that you're asking is whether there's some uh, legal rubric that's been violated. Um, there is uh, something called fraudulent conveyances, both under the bankruptcy law uh, and state insolvency law, as well as uh, the fundamental uh, common law. Um, and it had been the union's uh, uh, assertion, uh, uh, as well as uh, the creditors' uh, assertions, the Unsecured Creditors Committee, uh, or, or they had reached a judgment that there was a substantial basis uh, to view a number of the transactions that occurred as fraudulent conveyances. Um, and um, I don't know whether uh, you would view that um, as uh, something which violates the law, but there is clearly a remedy for those actions uh, under, under uh, state insolvency law and the bankruptcy law. And that is, in fact, what the uh, examiner concluded, that there was a substantial basis for that claim. <coughs> I, I appreciate all the additional information in order to regain the offensive here and, and continue directing this uh, my way. I want to thank you for your comments. I'm not, I'm not an attorney, and I'm not trying to prove definitively before this committee, Mr. Chairman, whether or whether or not there's a charge for it. I'm just trying to say if the air hangs heavy with a criminal charge, I, I want that cleared up now. And if there is a criminal charge, I, I want to see that filed in court and proceed along those lines. If not, I, I'd like to deal with only the facts so I, in my own mind I can make up uh, make a decision as to what really occurred and uh, obviously there is a strong case to say that the fund was abused but I want to see here both sides before I reach that conclusion. Now let me ask a couple other questions. How do you set the standards for the dollars involved? In other words, Mr. Lorenzo says that the liabilities for Texas Air are 400 to 500 million dollars, 400 to 450 million dollars. 
Some analysts say as high as $800 million, and PBGC says it's $980 million. Now, when these players sit down at a table to reach agreement, who forces that agreement? How are the figures agreed upon as a starting point? How can we begin to start? How can we begin if we don't know what the figures are, if everybody's not playing with the same equipment? If I could take, Please. A, take a crack at that. Um, for the moment, assuming that everyone is working off the same fact base, which I don't think is necessarily the case, and that everyone is talking about the same benefits, whether it's vested, total benefits, guaranteed, or whatever, there is a tremendous swing that can occur in unfunded liabilities depending on whether or not you believe the firm is going to continue to operate. If you calculate the liabilities of a pension plan on what's called an ongoing plan, ongoing company basis, you assume that um, people retire at, at pretty much of a normal age and therefore the uh, liabilities of the plan will tend to be the smallest you will estimate them. On the other hand, if you assume that the plan will terminate, the company will go out of business, and everybody who has a right to retire pretty much will submit their papers immediately, the cost can go astronomically. And in fact, this is an argument really that is not between the attorneys, it's between the actuaries in terms of how quickly do you believe someone is going to retire, how long are they going to live, and so forth. It's clear that whether or not Eastern's number of 400 million is accurate and the PBGC's $1.1 $1 .1 billion claim in the bankruptcy court is accurate, it has to do as much as anything with your judgment about whether you're talking about a termination or an ongoing plan. Well, let me go a couple steps further. The money obviously doesn't disappear, what money there is. And PBG states, uh, if I can find the statement, that they can go after, uh, oh, the uh, Texas Air Vice President made the statement that Texas Air has no liability for the disputed transaction, which includes the purchase of Eastern Air. Yet on the other hand, PBG says we can go after everything they have. Now, I guess I'm a little confused as to who has legal process in their favor here. PBGC is a guarantee corporation. Okay, can go after Texas Air when this is settled, whether they go, uh, you know, uh, whether Eastern goes bankrupt or not, or if they should, the worst should happen. Texas Air, you're saying, is getting away with this money, which they've obviously borrowed from uh, um, at the at this point legally, if at least uh, under question, but legally from the Eastern Air pension plan. Who can go after that right now? Who could go after uh, a recovery suit? We could file a recovery suit for the money that Texas Air would have or has used to do other things. Can anybody? Yeah. I, I think you've got the following issue at the moment. Um, assuming you've got two sets of issues. One of the problems here is that uh, PBGC's claim, unless they terminate a plan, uh, is uh, inchoate. Uh, the pension liabilities are inchoate. They don't have clear status under the bankruptcy uh, law. Um, Pardon except me. In Would the you case clarify of a, that? You say PBGC does not have clear status. I'm saying no. I'm saying the claim itself, the claim now okay. itself is in Uh Second thing, I guess, uh, is um, PBGC's claim, unless they've terminated the plan, uh, or unless they've uh, uh, taken a more aggressive position than they've taken before, uh, and that is that uh, effectively transactions that are occurring are fraudulent conveyances. Okay you know, uh, which uh, means that assets that would otherwise be available to them will not otherwise be available and the company is otherwise rendered insolvent as for Mr. Of a Mr. transaction, okay? Um, unless they take that position, uh, they have great difficulty uh, going after uh, Texas uh, Air at this point in time. Now, a third problem you have is once Eastern uh, has gone through bankrupt a bankruptcy proceeding and a plan of reorganization is approved, uh, to the extent there is a fraudulent conveyance otherwise present, uh, the approval by the bankruptcy court normally would, although one has to see what the transaction, uh, ultimate transaction here is, uh, normally would moot the issue of fraudulent conveyances because it resolves all claims that are outstanding. So unless PBGC weighs into the bankruptcy proceeding uh, and uh, objects to a plan uh, and it prevails with the bankruptcy court, uh, at least one of its claims may end up being mooted. That doesn't mean, however, that PBGC doesn't ultimately have a claim uh, against Texas Air uh, at that point in time that the plans uh, uh, are terminated uh, or some other event uh, occurs that, that renders what is otherwise an inchoate claim a, a coet claim, current claim. So it's uh, a bit murky. 
I was just going to simply point out that, that um, I agree with Brian, and, and one of the problems is whatever claim the PBGC has, unless it can somehow, put contingent claim, unless it can somehow perfect it, it is in effect being a lender to Texas Air and to its affiliates without having the ability like a normal banker to impose covenants, terms, and conditions other than that the minimum funding uh, payments be made every year. But in terms of what happens to the assets, whether or not they're burned up and so forth, they really don't have the leverage that a normal banker would have with that kind of liability uh, with a company as leveraged as Texas Air. All right, let me wrap up, Mr. Chairman. I know there are others who wish to question with just a, um, a, a quick simplification so I could, in my mind I can be sure I have grasped some of the elements here. The unsecured creditors are in trouble all the way. Is that correct? Correct. The secured creditors, if they should go bankrupt, if the worst should happen, can go to bankruptcy court and they will have first preference, even over the pension benefit, the, the, uh, the uh, persons covered in the benefit plan. Would they be ahead of the benefit plan? Would the benefit plan, the pension plan, be ahead of secured creditors? I'm, I'm, I'm now, uh, as far as the secured creditor question, they would be ahead of the PBGC, as we pointed out in our statement. Well, because uh, they're considered I, I, right now. Me, one moment, please. Uh, Mr. Sherry, I'm trying to put the PBGC in a certain, a separate category. I think they're in a pretty strong position no matter what. What I'm trying to talk about other secured creditors and the pension recipients. Who's in the priority position, the primary position here? Okay. Uh, secured creditors come ahead of PBGC. Uh, that's absolutely clear. And an unsecured creditor today, which is what's happened in the current uh, Eastern Reorg, or what is now proposed in the Eastern Reorganization Plan, uh, an unsecured creditor who would, uh, might otherwise be pari passu or even uh, subordinate to a limited degree uh, to PBGC will become senior to PBGC as a result of the reor current reorganization of Eastern Airlines. And so basically uh, PBGC is made junior cash, uh, which is uh, currently in uh, Eastern, which will be used to settle with uh, unsecured creditors, will not be available for PBGC. All right, I'll stop on that because I'm really totally confused. My information has from PBG itself that they have a, a superior position no matter what. To so, secured creditors? Uh, so, Not to yeah, secured uh, creditors. So I'm, no. I'm totally confused now. I well, thank the chairman. No, I, but I, th I think that may as describe the, the underlying problem at PBGC. Uh, as the hearing proceeds, I hope <laughs> I understand this better. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that's what we're trying to point out in our statement, all throughout our statement, because of their lack of movement. Whether it be in a bankruptcy court or on these waivers, they're sitting uh, way in left field when everybody else, you know, is moving out and becoming secured, uh, like the creditors committee. PBGC is behind them right now, and we don't understand it. They're not moving in and trying to get collateral. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding these hearings. I, I am a little ambivalent in asking questions because my ignorance is going to show through. Uh, but very candidly, I know these are very important hearings. I, um, I just want to be clear on a few things before I ask my other questions. Um, it was my understanding that um, when Mr. Lorenzo bought Eastern Airlines that the IMA and others thought, thank God we're, we're rid of Borman, uh, maybe Lorenzo is a hope for us. Um, is that a fair, um, uh, um, I'm talking in the initial stages. That's really not true. Okay. Because they sold the airlines in the middle of the night. I think it was 2.30 a.m. on February 22nd. I just, I just want to say one thing to you, sir, and I don't mean, yeah. mean this um, in any way to, to imply that you're saying something that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just want to say that you're under oath, and um, your credibility with me is on all your statements. And so I'm going to judge your testimony based on everything you tell me. Um, and my question to you is it not true that the IMA uh, was happy that uh, Borman was no longer going to be running this airline and thought that in some way Mr. Lorenzo promised some hope? In other words, it couldn't be worse, maybe it'll be better. In my opinion, once again, no. Uh, our present general chairman at that time of District 100, Charlie Bryan, did send Mr. Lorenzo a telegram inviting him to set up better relationships that existed before Mr. Lorenzo took over. To date, it's still unanswered. Well, you, you, further, sorry. you also got to remember that Mr. Lorenzo, just prior to moving in and taking over Eastern Airlines, he was trying to acquire Transworld Airlines. Mm -hmm. And we opposed that emphatically. Not only the IAM, but ALPA and also uh, uh, you, uh, IFA, the Flight Attendants Union on TWA. The relationship that the IMA had with Mr. Borman was not a good one, isn't that correct? 
it got kind of rocky on the tail end. Initially, when he went to the company, we had a pretty decent relationship, and it got real bad after that. Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is it was a pretty terrible relationship. That's and, correct. Yeah. And it was uh, obviously the opinion of your union and others that Mr. Borman had run it to the ground. Isn't that not also correct? No, he did not run it to the ground. It was not run into the ground until Mr. Lorenzo took over in the fall of 1986. That was the start of it, in our opinion. Okay, so everything was going great with Eastern, no problems with Eastern, um, and uh, it would have been great if Mr. Borman had continued to run the company? No, we had, Eastern Airlines had financial problems, as you well know. Our union and the rest of the unions on the property since 1976 gave back in wages alone better than one billion dollars to keep that carrier afloat. And it, uh, I recall the IMA and others were very, very critical of Mr. Borman. If we can't establish this point, I just feel like not asking you any more questions. Uh, isn't it not true that you were very critical of Mr. Borman and that the company was in serious problems? The carrier was in serious problems. I think I just explained that since starting since 1976 up until the time Mr. Lorenzo took over. And yes, there were statements made by this organization that we asked for his resignation. Okay, thank you. Um, I happen to be no fan of Mr. Lorenzo. I just want to make sure that I'm, we're on the same wavelength. I understand. Okay. Um, it's funny, I even feel I have to say that. Um, <laughs> what do you think Mr. Lorenzo bought? What, what was the status of the airline when he bought it? What did he buy? What did, in essence, what did he get, in your judgment? It was a major carrier. It was one of the major carriers uh, flying the north-south routes here in the United States of America. Making, it was in existence uh, going back into the 30s. Making a profit or making a loss? When he took over? Mm -hmm. uh, at the time uh, he took over, they were uh, suffering a loss, but he did make money in 1987, as I recall it. When he bought the airline, I'm assuming that he also bought the unfunded pension liability as well. Is that not correct? Well, yes, he assumed uh, right. uh, the pension liability of all uh, the unions on a property. Which was not an unsizable uh, uh, liability, as I recall. To my knowledge, back in 86, it was not. It was not what? It was not a huge unfunded uh, program. What do you think it was? I have to ask the question a minute. I'm trying to think of it. I mean, this is what we're here for today, so I would think you'd know the answer to that. I understand that. But that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, the unfunded obligations were, were, were certainly there. We believe we've seen them grow significantly what, each. What were they? Um, I, I couldn't tell you what the total unfunded obligations were. First of all, as Mr. Lucan's question pointed out, it depends on whether or not you're talking about an ongoing plan basis or a terminated plan basis. I can tell you that for the IAM's pension plan in 19... 86, which would have been for the plan year 1985, mm -hmm. uh, the plan was probably around 85% funded. I can't tell you what it is today because we haven't had access to that data in almost two years. Well, you've, you've stated that you think the pension liability is a certain figure today, don't We've you? We've stated the pension liability that has been a certain, w the, the number that we use, the $1.1 billion number is the claim that was submitted by the PBGC uh, before the bankruptcy court. <laughs> And it's our understanding that, that number is on a termination basis, liquidation company basis. That's what we believe that number represents. Okay. But you are not prepared in any way to tell us what you think that pension liability went from to? I'm, what, you're, what, you're not from prepared. to? I would think that, that this would be something that, that would be, yeah, you'd be let very let me, aware of. Let me, I haven't gone back and looked okay. at it recently. My recollection is that the underfunding at the commencement of this, this right. process, uh, which is the end of 85 uh, or middle of 86, uh, was uh, significantly lower than what it is today. And, and the problem that we have is comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. um, it is clear using uh, the uh, the range uh, or comparable number to the range of four to six uh, hundred. Uh, if we took six hundred as the number, uh, my recollection is that the uh, underfunding was approximately three hundred or three fifty. So it has increased uh, significantly since then. Obviously, if you use the billion one number, then the uh, the underfunding would would in increase proportionately. Eastern has been required, and I think has been making its its required uh, payments into the fund. Is that not correct, even though it's not really operating? Yes, it, it, it has been, it's been given three different waivers, but one of the things that it's important to understand... No, I need to understand that. Okay, um, it my, has been given three different funding waivers. So you're saying they have not been required no. to make the full payments? What I said is they were given three different funding waivers, they have made payments on two of them, they have one that's outstanding at the I moment. I guess I don't understand what you mean by a funding waiver. 
A funding waiver is where an, em uh, an employer goes to the Internal Revenue Service and says that in order to survive, we need um, to have, uh, in effect, um, a, a pass on making the contributions that are due for the previous plan year. But, and if we don't make those contributions, we'll survive. But if we do, it will cause us effectively to, to hit the tank. So your testimony is that they obviously have not been making their payments. No, if, if I could, my testimony is, I was actually using that as a preface to the reason for the increase yeah, in the I'm just trying not to be confused here. I have right. some people telling me they make their payments. I'm having some people saying they're not. I want to know what no. you're telling me. What I'm telling you is, it's, to the best of my knowledge, they obtained three funding waivers mm -hmm. in the time frame that is covered by our testimony. We, we opposed those funding waivers because we did not think they were required and we believed that they were part of effectively of a, a financing plan that were not in the interest of Eastern, its plans or its participants. Mm -hmm. However, they have repaid two of those funding waivers. They have one outstanding at this point, to my knowledge, for $26 million. But if I could, it's important to understand that Eastern Airlines was not a static company during the time that Mr. Lorenzo had it. One of the major points of contention between the unions, the workforce at Eastern, and Mr. Lorenzo is that they significantly reduced the size of Eastern Airlines. That has a dramatic effect on the pension liabilities of a company because what happens as you start to shrink a company, more employees start to retire earlier as they see a company that doesn't have a future in it. And one of the deep problems that they had is that they consistently had younger average retirement ages, which dramatically pushed up the liability. That's the major reason for the growth in liabilities under Texas Air. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a very large increase, and it was due, at least in our view, to the actions that they were taking as they were taking assets out of Eastern and transferring them into the, uh, in, under the control of either another Texas Air subsidiary, uh, System One, or Continental. Sure, uh, Mr. Shays. Um, there are two, two issues of shortfall here. Uh, it's, it's not one item that we're talking about. There's the underfunding, right. which assumes you satisfy the le legal requirements to make payments in a year, but is the amount of the shortfall uh, between uh, assets and uh, projected assets. For the record, when there is underfunding and then later on the funds are replenished, is that done with interest? Um, the, um, well, the answer is on underfunding. Uh, my if they get a waiver. A waiver is different than underfunding. If I they get a waiver. Uh, depends upon the terms negotiated. Uh, generally, it is with interest, but uh, I don't recollect what the, the, uh, the legislative requirement on, uh, on a waiver is. But it can be with, 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 uh, with interest, and it can be secured as well. But it doesn't have to be with interest? Um, I believe, I believe that, that, in effect, what happens is if any of you who have ever looked at the way actuaries put together the, the asset and liability. I have a very simple question. Okay, the, the answer is... If a is, waiver is granted, I that means the company doesn't have to pay, say, $50 million. Over a period of time, it has to repay that $50 million. And it has to be amortized with interest, it's my understanding. Okay, that's my question. Yeah. Um, let, let's sort of go back. Separating underfunding, which is the amount of the shortfall at the, uh, <coughs> on any, any date, uh, that was the amount that we were, we were focusing on primarily. Since, however, um, the uh, Texas Air Acquisition of Eastern, uh, we were also talking about additional waivers, that is, payments that would otherwise be due uh, under, um, under the uh, Internal Revenue Code and, uh, and, the Department of, and, and under ERISA, uh, which, uh, for which payment was deferred, uh, which is what Congressman Lantos is, is Talk, talking about now, and there you have a specific agreement, to pay, uh, a specific obligation to pay a specific amount for w uh, which uh, the payment of which is deferred. Um, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it more, more uh, carefully, uh, uh, with interest. My understanding is, if you have an unfunded uh, pension program, you have so many years to try to bring it up to full mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if they're underfunded, they're going to be putting in more than they would have to just to, to stay current. They have to, to, to build up for the, the, for the past liability. But it's your testimony, I think, that you're suggesting that they increase their liabilities. Uh, obviously, they became smaller. They have less active employees, but they still have employees that have vested rights. And they have some employees that are retiring earlier. Uh, and it's your testimony that that's helped to increase the liability. 
I think it's also your testimony that whatever liability exists by, by the parent company uh, and, and whatever assets exist in Eastern, um, that they are clearly uh, trying to un unload their best assets and escape as much liability and uh, be able, first to be able to make that transfer and not have uh, that being used for to subordinate the, the uh, government's potential mm -hmm. claim. The one thing I'm convinced, and this is what I, I know there have to be changes to the, the PBGC, uh, I know that uh, administratively, and there has to be a change in attitude as to what that change is, I haven't made up my mind. I know there has to be some changes in the law. I mean, I think that's clear. You are, we're using, I think, Eastern Airlines as a, as a good example of where maybe uh, we can most visibly see where these changes have to take place. Obviously, I also have an interest to deal with the, the specific issue of Eastern Airlines. Is it your testimony, though, uh, getting back to, to this issue, they, they did fund, they did buy an airline that had assets and it had liabilities, significantly underfunded pensions. And the only way it really pays for them is to buy an airline that can, can, can be profitable and even begin to pay it back the liability into the fund. Or another way is just to take parts of it and eventually liquidate it and and to hold someone else holding the bag. The last thing we want is to have the government hold the bag for any of this pension. Now, could they have technically bought the airline with 79% interest originally and not had any uh, requirement uh, to fund uh, the, to be the deep pocket of Texas Air? That would have technically been possible, although, again, um, if you look at at least the, um, the way Mr. Lorenzo has operated in the past, he's um, at least at first tended to like to go in and eliminate minority shareholders um, and at, at some point he may then spin off assets to do so. I would point out by the way that uh, at the time Texas Air acquired Eastern one of the comments that you got from the analysts is, is that because we thought it was a pretty low price um, is that the the price that they paid reflected the fact that he was buying an unfunded pension obligation. Well, we can't ignore that. I mean, it's uh, a significant. It's a significant. No, but, but nonetheless, he paid. He, the price he paid was was reflective of the fact that he was accepting a liability. It's just mm -hmm. like when you buy a company with debt, your purchase price is lower to the extent that you're accepting the obligations of that debt. Mm -hmm. There's no question the strike is hurt as well. Um, Which obviously, we believe they they did everything they could to provoke. Well, okay, and 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 I may disagree with that, and and some may. I mean, um, but the fact is, to put it on the table, the strike has been very harmful. And ultimately, the federal government may have to pay some of the brunt of that strike. Is that not correct? Well, I don't think it's a result of the strike. I mean, like Randy said, he thought... How can you say that? How can you say because that if you've got an operation that is a strike, it's not bringing in revenues? I understand that. Okay. Well, this is his game plan. You know, members of Congress just got to go back and... I don't care what his game plan is. That's not the question I asked him. Whether you played into his game plan, whether you had to have the strike or not, that's your decision. He had no choice. Okay, that's your opinion. Uh, and obviously, you have a lot of workers who are putting their lives on the line. My question to you was, isn't it not true that this strike has had a serious impact on the operation of the airline and obviously on the pension uh, liability? That's well, my question. On your question, excuse me, yeah. on your question, yes. It yeah. has hurt him quite a bit financially. And, it is and also uh, he's not running the airline uh, near as what it was on March 4, 1989, even though he's painting a big glorious picture in the newspapers that he is. Uh, isn't it also true that the pension liability has obviously gone up significantly as a result of that? No, not really, because uh, when I was sitting at the bargaining table with his chief negotiators and so forth, and I explained it earlier, he did not provide any increase in pensions to the IM pension plan, and he froze it, and it's presently froze, as I understand it, for five years. Let me be, uh, be clear on something else. If you said he's had two waivers, he, the, the company, three, and two have been paid back, um, it seems to me that if a company it does not have uh, a significant flow of revenue in, that it is a logical argument that you would make to the PBGC that you don't have the revenue to pay. Now, your point is that maybe he can take it from cash or he can take it from the sale of certain assets. But, I mean, a reasonable people obviously can understand, it seems to me, that, that if you have a company that's on strike, you don't have the revenue to pay a lot of necessary expenses, including one into the pension fund. The fact of the matter is that, the fact of the, matter is that um, the, 
the legal standards, as I understand it, for a funding waiver are not simply that, as Phil Bakes, in fact, uh, testified in court at one point, that the pension plans is just another form of corporate finance. There are standards that, as I understand it, require that if you get the waiver, that you can survive and you can demonstrate that. And if you don't get the waiver, you won't survive. We were arguing that it was not, the waivers were not critical to Eastern survival. As, a re as an indication of that, a few days before Texas Air Eastern filed for bankruptcy, Eastern repaid its last previous waiver and, in fact, paid $117 million into Eastern's pension plan. See, the accusation, though, that's made, yes, you want to finish? I was going to say, yeah. we were delighted with that, but it seemed to us that, again, just following your logic, if here was a company that was in deep trouble, why would it all of a sudden then voluntarily accelerate payments um, into the pension plan? We were happy that happened, but it seemed to us that the reason for that is that once you get into bankruptcy, you have to get uh, bankruptcy court approval in order to make those contributions. And if at that point it's not approved, this is where the PBGC does have some very strong muscle because at that point it becomes a cause of action against the control group parent. And we believe that that action actually was taken to protect Texas Air um, at that point in spite of the fact that Eastern was within uh, days of filing bankruptcy and why do you file bankruptcy to conserve cash? Okay. But we can't have it both ways here. And Mr. Chairman, I'll be finished in just a okay, sec, but you. You, I don't think we can have it both ways. We can't say mm -hmm. that the union is bringing Eastern Airlines to its knees and all <coughs> Mr. Uh, Lorenzo's br bravado saying we're holding on uh, is, is fallacious and then say they have lots of money to put in, in a lot of different things, including into the pension. It just seems to me that we're saying two different things. Um, my point to you is, and, and, and just in general, forgetting Eastern Airlines, is it, is it a legitimate uh, basis for a company to decide not to be, or ask for a waiver that they have a strike and that they don't have revenue coming in? Is that a legitimate basis, and it should, should it be, to not put money into the pension fund? Yeah, the, the response to that is obviously something which is uh, situational. Every case is, uh, is unique. It depends okay. upon what the, the uh, cash balance the company has True. in it. Uh, it depends, uh, as in the case of uh, Eastern, uh, what subsequently happens. Uh, as you see in the reorganization plan, Eastern has cash. Uh, it's other creditors that will be getting it. Uh, I think standing alone uh, without, uh, without more, uh, obviously if you don't have cash coming into the company, uh, uh, depending upon the rest of the facts and circumstances present, what assets you have, uh, what, uh, how leveraged the company is, what other obligations the company has, it's something to be considered. Well, I guess I, I, I was finding myself saying, my God, why would the PBGC allow any waivers? This is outrageous. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you in your testimony. Mm -hmm. And then I hear you telling me you're bringing the company to its knees, mm -hmm. and then I'm saying, well, there's some logic then, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I've got to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, pro the, the point I think that, that is what we're trying to make, though, is during the same period of time, other funds were being upstream directly or indirectly, okay. and, and, that, and that, that's really what, what the context is. It has okay. to be considered in the context of the other facts present. I think th that's a very good point, and that's, and that's the issue that I know the bankruptcy court is looking at as well. Is it your testimony, though, just to, to, to go with Mr. Lukens, that, that the, this incredible, um, the liability that ultimately could be the government's, uh, and the fact that we basically secure this just as we do to, to depositors at, to, at uh, uh, we back it up with the full faith and credit of the United States government. Is it your testimony that, that these pension funds stand back in line to other creditors? Uh, depends upon what other creditors you're talking about. we're talking about. If, if the question is to other unsecured, I mean to secured creditors, yes. Yeah, if secured? the question is to unsecured creditors today who become secured tomorrow as a result of uh, a reorganization plan or another uh, transaction that occurs, as long as it uh, doesn't violate uh, the rules on fraudulent conveyances, or even if it does, as long as it's not determined to, uh, then the answer is yeah. Would it also be your testimony that, that, um, that in some cases the PBGC has been a, a willing accomplice in this effort, but that in some cases that they lack certain powers to prevent Lorenzo to do some of the things he's doing? Um, I, you know, I don't know whether I, you know, I don't like in things like this to, to sort of use, uh, this is me personally now. That's right. I use rhetoric. Okay. I use rhetoric a lot for other things. Um, the re if we look at the facts, what I'm that's to, what, a result, what I'm the, a result say, of what, the facts. Excuse me a second. What I'm trying to do is cut into this rhetoric and know what isn't rhetoric and what is facts. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. The answer is the result of its action or inaction has been to uh, produce certain results which if looked at objectively one would wonder whether the agency has been uh, protecting the federal fisc in the way that it could have or should have. L let me just conclude by taking these recommendations which I find helpful to the extent that I understand them. Um, your, your first recommendation dealing with the transfer of a assets upstream and so on, you say the PBGC uh, should be empowered and required to ensure that any upstreaming of assets be accompanied with a comparable upstreaming of liabilities. Uh, is that something that cannot be done now or, or only can be done under certain circumstances? I, I, yes, sir. I, again, part of the problem is, is without a termination, it is unclear, at least to me, what liquidated claims the PBGC has to assert. And it's very clear that in the Eastern case and many others, the simple sale of an asset without a bankruptcy or other major corporate turmoil, um, it doesn't appear that the PBGC has the ability to step and say, wait a minute, this asset's moving, we would like part of the liability to move with it. Yeah, it seems very obvious. And if, if that can't be done, um, then it's something that needs to be addressed very quickly. Uh, your point, too, um, dealing with the, um, with the parent company and the 80%, uh, what is the logic that prevented us from doing 50% originally? I mean, what, what will the other side tell me later on? Um, it seems logical, to, it, it's the deep pocket issue. Um, it seems to me anyone who has basically controlling interest in the company uh, should assume that liability. Unfortunately, I haven't read the debates when the 80% was set. Um, my understanding is that it was the typical dickering over what's the right percentage to set on something that imposes a major potential liability on someone. Yeah. But let me ask you this, does the PBGC, uh, it, does Lorenzo have the ability to, to lose, uh, to bring himself under 79% without the PBGC preventing it? It's my understanding that the only time the PBGC can go after assets that have been sold out from under a control group is that if it can demonstrate that the sale was for the purpose of evading the liability. If you can demonstrate that it was done for that purpose, then you apparently have the ability to go after it. Without being able to demonstrate the motive, uh, it's my understanding that they cannot go after something below the 80% threshold. You know, one of the questions I'll just throw out for future, for those who follow after is, is what the logic would be. It's, it would seem to me that we would, would want to say that any time someone buys controlling interest with a liability, that they clearly have to address that liability and cannot unload it onto someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, excuse me. They can unload it, not unload it on the government. They can transfer it, and that, that group that buys it would clearly have to pick it up. I mean, it just seems logical to me. Let me just do, may I just go to, please? Um, well, let me just say, I, I thank you for the recommendations. I find that very helpful, and, and I think a lot of good will come from this hearing, so I appreciate you all being here. Quite welcome. Before uh, we release you, are there any other comments any of you gentlemen would like to make? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for Mr. your appearance. Chair. Our next panel consists of Captain Randy Babbitt, the Airline Pilots Association, as Nancy Toss of the Transport Workers of America. Would you please stand and raise your right hands? You solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Please be seated. We're pleased to have all of you. Uh, Captain Babbitt, if you identify the person accompanying you and uh, Ms. Toss also, and um, we will begin with uh, Captain Babbitt. Your uh, prepared statement will be entered in the record in its entirety. And after we have made the introductions, you may proceed in your own way, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, with me today is Elizabeth Colby. And she is a pension and benefit attorney and the employee of the Airline Pilots Association. We're glad to have you, Ms. Colby. And you are <coughs> accompanied by? Arthur Luby, who is general counsel to the Transport Workers Union. We're glad to have you, Mr. Luby. Uh, Captain, if I might ask you to pull the mic very close to you. You might want to do it on the side, right? OK. 
Okay. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members. I am Randy Babbitt, and I'm the Executive Administrator of the Airline Pilots Association. And I, on behalf of ALPA, would like to thank you for this opportunity to uh, testify here this morning on the important issue of pension security. I've been a pilot with Eastern Airlines for 23 years, and over those or that period of time, I represented the Airline Pilots Association in numerous bargaining situations and collective bargaining uh, that have resulted in agreements with many carriers, including Eastern Airlines. And I'm currently participating in the ongoing negotiations between ALPA and Eastern Airlines. Could I ask you to pull it a bit closer because... Maybe I'll move forward. That's good. There we go. That's good. Uh, as is true in most collective bargaining relationships, uh, pension plans have played a chief role in those negotiations, and not only to improve the level of the negotiated pension benefits, but also to protect those benefits uh, and, and insisting on provisions that would promote adequate funding. Uh, for example, in the past, uh, ALPA and Eastern Airlines have agreed that each retiree's pension benefits would be guaranteed by the purchase of an insured annuity contract that came from a reliable insurance company. Uh, this protection, unfortunately, could no longer be maintained in collective bargaining. And then Alpha insisted that at least the assets of those pension benefits were backed by high quality bonds. Uh, also, and until recently, our collective bargaining agreement required that Eastern would make monthly contributions to the pension plan. Now, these contributions were not tied <coughs> to the federal minimum funding standards, but instead were contractual relationships and therefore couldn't be deferred through pension waivers. Uh, as a, another example and a final example uh, with what we had obtained in collective bargaining, <coughs> we had an agreement that Eastern Airlines would not apply for funding waivers without consulting uh, with the Airline Pilots Association. However, all of these, with few exceptions, these protections that I've mentioned, have been eroded or eliminated through Eastern's persistent and unwavering efforts to avoid pension plan liabilities. We feel that Eastern has flouted its obligations under the pension plans, and as a direct result, we're here today focusing on the safety of the pension plans and the role of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation as they play in Eastern's reorganization in bankruptcy. In this regard, I think uh, it would be beneficial if we take a, a brief look at the history of the circumstances that we presently face at Eastern. Eastern, as you've heard in earlier testimony, maintains 11 defined benefit pension plans <coughs> for its employees, and one of these plans covers the pilots. Under present law, the obligation to fund these plans rests not only with Eastern, but also with each member of the control group of which Eastern is a member. Eastern control group includes, as I'm sure you're aware, Texas Air Corps, Continental Airlines, uh, and other business associates and affiliates of Texas Air Corps. If any one of Eastern's plans were to terminate without sufficient assets to pay the benefits earned by the plan's participants, then Eastern and each member of Eastern's control group would be liable to make up that shortfall. The amount of this shortfall, known as the unfunded liability, is staggering. If all of Eastern's plans terminated today, the amount it would take to make those plans whole is arguably between $450 million to $1.1 billion. The reason that this range of estimates is so broad uh, was described briefly in earlier testimony, but it's basically uh, a function of the assumed interest rate. And the actuaries involved in making those assumptions uh, will use different rates. Suffice it to say that the lower the interest rate assumption, the greater the liabilities, and therefore the greater the amount of the unfunded liability. And there's really no disagreement, however, whether it's 450 million or 1.1 billion, the amount of Eastern's unfunded Pension funding waivers that have received these from the Internal Revenue Service. 
And these waivers apply to the annual contributions Eastern should have made in 1983, 1986, 88, and 89, pursuant to the federal uh, minimum standards for funding. Now, under a funding waiver, Eastern really gets a, a mammoth loan from the pension plans with the blessing of the IRS. And instead of making the annual contribution when it's due, the funding waiver permits Eastern to pay back the contribution in a piecemeal fashion over the years with the real financial exposure to the plan participants and to the PBGC. We believe that Eastern has brazenly taken advantage of the overall waiver procedure. And as you've heard in earlier testimony, they view it as nothing more than an expedient means to borrow from pension plans rather than other uh, institutional type lenders that would require their own stringent requirements for repayment. Unfortunately, the IRS has never failed to accommodate Eastern in its quest to borrow from the pension plans. And all of this occurs to the detriment of the plan's participants whose pension benefits then are not adequately funded and may therefore never be paid, and also to the detriment of the PBGC, which at some point could ultimately be called upon to pay all or a portion of those unfunded liabilities. When Congress tightened up the waiver rules in 1987, it was reacting in part to Eastern's brazen abuses. And in its report on the Pension Protection Act, the House Budget Committee made the following observations, and I will quote, in the past, funding waivers have been obtained under circumstances never intended by Congress, and the clarification of the conditions of such waivers is necessary to prevent future misunderstandings. For example, the committee is aware of a situation in which an airline company obtained funding waivers for its 1985 contributions, due in 1986, to 11 pension plans. Despite the fact that it had sufficient cash to make the contributions, it obtained the waiver because it chose to use the cash to consummate a merger with another airline company and make related distributions to shareholders. In effect, the pension plans were involuntary financiers of the airline company's business ventures. In addition, through this device of getting low-cost loans from its plans by deferring the required contributions, the airline company gained a competitive advantage with respect to labor cost over other airline companies that made their pension contributions. Congress never intended that funding waivers would be granted under such circumstances. That a waiver was granted is a clear indication for the need for clarification and tightening of the current waiver standards. Well, we at ALPA are pleased that this subcommittee finds the circumstances at Eastern worthy of investigation. And you've asked us to focus on the role of the PBGC as it relates to Eastern's unfunded pension liability. And we have several concrete suggestions which we believe, if followed, would increase benefit security and decrease the possibility that plan sponsors could thrust unwanted pension liability onto the PBGC. Our first suggestion is that the PBGC should have the authority to determine whether or not to grant an employer's application to waive its pension funding obligations. Uh, in retrospect, you can clearly see that the IRS stands to lose nothing if it grants a funding waiver. The PBGC itself and the plan participants, however, stand to lose a lot if a funding waiver is granted, especially if it's not repaid. And we believe then that the decision to grant or deny a funding waiver is more properly within the purview of the PBGC. And we would recommend that this decision-making authority be transferred to the PBGC, or at a minimum, the decision should be reached jointly in consultation between the PBGC and the IRS. Additionally, <clears throat> the decision makers should be required to consult and involve the plan participants and others who will be directly affected by the decision to grant or deny a waiver application, including the union in the case of collectively bargained plans. Our next suggestion is to permit plan participants to examine an employer's application for a funding waiver in order to permit them to submit meaningful comments to the IRS. Under present law, the union and the plan participants must receive notice from an employer that's applied to the IRS for a funding waiver, and the IRS is obligated to 
uh, review and consider any comments filed by the participants. However, there's no requirement that either the union or the plan participants even get a copy of the employer's application for a waiver. So it's not really possible for interest parties to contribute any meaningful commentary on the waiver application, for example, whether or not the statutory criteria were met, uh, whether the company in this case has misstated or misrepresented facts as they would pertain to labor. <clears throat> it's really illogical in our view that from the standpoint of national pension policy, that the persons with the greatest risk and those with the greatest at stake on the outcome of a funding waiver are prevented from reviewing the purported facts on which the employer's right to claim a funding waiver is based. It's but a futile act to submit comments on a waiver application one never sees, although unfortunately it's an act that ALPA has performed many times in conjunction with Eastern's funding waiver applications. Our third suggestion is that the PBGC given, be given special status, especially in bankruptcy and in cases where the employer, such as Eastern, maintains a pension plan with a large unfunded liability. Another recommendation would be to provide the PBGC with better and direct access to the financial records of the entire control group of corporations where a member of the control group maintains a plan with an ar a large unfunded liability. An additional recommendation is that the PBGC and the IRS should also report their findings to the participants in plans with large unfunded liabilities. Our next recommendation is to expand control group liability for distress termination in the event of a corporate sale. Again, stepping back to current law, each member today of a control group of corporations is liable to fund a pension plan sponsored by any one of the members in the controlled group. However, the control group itself can eliminate this liability by selling the weak corporation and thereby removing it from the control group. In one of its many plans for Eastern's reorganization, Texas Air Corps actually tried to absolve itself of liability for Eastern's pension plans by proposing to decrease its own ownership in Eastern down to 60%. Well, this is clearly below the 80% level required to maintain the control group responsibility. Uh, had it not been for objections raised by the unions and the plan participants, and presumably the PBGC, Texas Air might well have accomplished its goal. However, uh, in the bankruptcy uh, arena, sounder minds prevailed, and Eastern uh, is still a subsidiary directly now of Texas Air Corps. Had Texas Air prevailed, Eastern pension plans in that scenario would not be backed up by Texas Air or Continental. Uh, the only exception to that statement would be if it could be proved that the principal purpose of the transaction to divest itself of Eastern Airlines was to avoid pension liability. If this could have been proven, then Texas Air, Continental, and other affiliates within the control group would have been on the hook for five years uh, on that pension liability following the date that Eastern was removed from the control group. But I take it your assumption is that if there is a multiplicity of motivation, it's very difficult to demonstrate that one of the motives was the principal motive when there may be five motives. Yes, sir. Okay. Please uh, go ahead. Further, we uh, would actually suggest that the motive itself not be considered and that we propose that the law be amended to delete the requirement entirely uh, that the principal purpose for the transaction was to avoid the pension liability. And under our recommendation, the liability would remain for a period of five years, irrespective of the motive. All of the foregoing recommendations uh, that I have spoken to uh, were directly designed to increase PBGC authority and pension security overall. Our last recommendation, however, uh, is more of a restraint on the PBGC in terms of them entering discussions which may directly impact ongoing collective bargaining. And our concern stems from the thwarted efforts of the National Mediation Board and several unions at Eastern to persuade the President of the United States to appoint a presidential emergency board called for under the Railway Labor Act to investigate and recommend a solution to the negotiating impasse that at that time was reached by Eastern Airlines and the Machinist Union. The National Mediation Board, as you know, had recommended to the President that such a board be established. 
We believe that the PBGC, after several meetings with Eastern, weighed in with the White House, either directly or through the Department of Labor, to urge that such a board not be appointed. Eastern had asserted, and asserted in public, I might add, that if a PEB was established, that act in itself would force it to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and thus raising the risk to the PBGC <clears throat> with regard to the unfunded pension liabilities. In doing this, the PBGC, along with many others, was badly misled by Eastern. And by subscribing to Eastern's pre-strike rhetoric and scare tactics, the PBGC actually increased its risk far beyond what they would have been exposed to had a presidential board been established and a strike avoided. The difference, uh, so that you have a complete comprehension of that difference, there was a $30 million disagreement on an annualized basis between the machinist and Eastern Airlines, which the machinist offered to submit to binding arbitration. The course chosen by, absent a presidential emergency board, has been the liquidation at Eastern Airlines of over $1.2 billion in real assets and losses that amount to almost $3 million a day for what is now approaching 400 days. Congressman Shays. Aren't you making an assumption that that board would come to a certain conclusion and that they would have been able to do a certain thing? Yes, I mean, sir, I am. Well, the, the disparity yeah. at the time, as was my understanding from both parties, was that there was a $30 million annual disagreement. Uh, in other words, the contractual package that the machinists had on the table uh, was worth on an annualized basis $30 million a year, more than the corporation was willing to pay the machinists. And they offered to submit that particular amount to binding arbitration. So I would suggest it wouldn't have been worse than $30 million. It, it I would presumably, uh, if Solomon had prevailed, they would have split the baby to a $15 million issue, mm -hmm. would be my assumption. But it just strikes me that your, your, your emphasis of a $30 million difference, and you say it's a very slight difference, would imply that neither side should have gone on strike for such a small amount. Well, the machinist had requested, uh, along with the uh, National Mediation Board, that the parties had become polarized enough to require the services of an arbitrator. Yeah. And but I wouldn't suggest for a second that the, there were not a lot of tensions and a lot of disagreements at the bargaining table. Yeah. And that's why the strike is so pathetic, because it was over such a small amount, and it's unfortunate. Uh, as to who's responsible is another question. Yes, sir. Well, I'll summarize that uh, with this statement, that the mere fact that Eastern itself maintains underfunded pension plans should not really serve as justification for the PBGC to comment subjectively and apparently to the union, along with all other stakeholders, detriment uh, in the context of ongoing negotiations. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the association I represent believes that it's in the joint interest of the PBGC, the unions, and the plan participants to see that pension benefits are adequately funded. We believe that an expansion of the authority of the PBGC will result in greater pension security to plan participants. And ALPA stands ready to assist this subcommittee in any way in order that we could reach this common goal. I thank you for the opportunity, and we will remain here for available for questions. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Captain. We'll have a number of questions, but first we'll hear from Ms. Nancy Taus, Transport Workers of America. We're delighted to have you. Your prepared statement will be in the record in its entirety. You may proceed any way you choose. Good morning. My name is...